Select's Continuing Education Committee hosts today for the webinar, Copyright and Contracts, Moving Beyond Text and IRs, and to introduce the presenter, Lisa Macklin. Lisa is the Director, Libraries and Intellectual Property Rights Office for Emory University. She received her library degree from the University of South Florida and her law degree from Georgia State. In her position, Lisa focuses on copyright, licensing, and scholarly communication issues, working with faculty and students on the application of copyright law to teaching, research, and publishing. Her interests include transformations in scholarship and publishing, including new models of scholarship in digital form and the open access movement. If you have questions for Lisa, please type them into the question box on your screen. She will answer questions midway through the presentation and at the conclusion. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. A link to the slides will also be provided. I will now turn the webinar over to Lisa and there may be a slight delay during this process. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be talking about copyright and contracts, um, as Cindy mentioned, specifically focusing on moving beyond text and in institutional repositories. First of all, we have to start with a disclaimer. Um, as an attorney, I am an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. Um, however, you probably have access to a general counsel's office or um, you may have access to outside counsel on your campus. So in talking about institutional repositories, in this context we're really talking about text, although that's not going to be our emphasis, but numeric data, photos, video, learning objects, those things that are created by our faculty and our students, or perhaps are in our library collections. So first let's start with a polling question. And this is just to give me an idea of your confidence level when applying copyright and contracts to institutional repositories. So if you can go ahead and click on the poll that you'll see. Um, and basically, I'm going to take a moment to give you an overview of the presentation. First, we're going to cover copyright in general, and then we're going to pause and have some questions. And then I'm going to move on to copyright applied to specific non-textual materials. And then third, really talk about social media sites and some of the contracts that you can find on social media sites. So it looks like um, basically half of you um, feel that your confidence is medium and 42% low, um, only 8% high, and hopefully some of those who fall in the 8%, perhaps you can share your experiences during the question and answer session, because I think we often learn best from each other. Um, so let's start with copyright law. And copyright law actually comes from the Constitution. Um, and the purpose of copyright law is this balance of promoting the progress of science and the useful arts against these exclusive rights that are granted to creators. And with copyright law, it protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And what is important here is the originality piece. Um, works do have to be original. And this idea of fixation. Um, what I'm saying to you, because it is being recorded, is being fixed, um, so therefore is copyrightable. If we were having a conversation on the phone where there's no recording, that wouldn't be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And this list that you see here really does cover those things that we use on a regular basis um, and even have in our collections. One of the things to realize with choreographic works um, is that they can be copyrighted if they're written down. So they're then fixed in this tangible medium of expression. And even blueprints for architectural works can be copyrighted. However, as broad as copyright is, it doesn't actually cover everything. There are things that are not protected by copyright titles, names, short phrases, slogans, etc. 
um, facts, news, and discoveries are not protected by copyright. So that includes data, things that are um, numeric data or even factual data. As you're probably very aware, works created by the U.S. government are not protected by copyright. Ideas are not protected by copyright, although business processes, some methods, etc., may be patentable. And this idea of originality um, comes up again for things that can't be protected by copyright. Um, the, for example, a phone book in alphabetical order cannot be protected by copyright. We know this because there was a court case um, called Feist in which that very issue was adjudicated. And the court found that a phone book is a logical arrangement of data. There is no other way to arrange a phone book really that is useful except by last name. And so a phone book is not um, subject to copyright protection. So the rights of a copyright owner are to reproduce the work, um, prepare derivative works, and that's one work derived from another. Um, for example, the movie um, Eat, Pray, Love with Julia Roberts is actually derived from the book. Um, so that's a common popular cultural example of derivative work. In academia, an example of a derivative work would be a journal article that becomes a book chapter. And then there's the right to distribute copies of the work and publicly perform the work. So this is a bundle of rights. Copyright is actually not a single right, but a bundle of rights. And because it's a bundle of rights, they can be pulled apart and, and separated. And for an institutional repository, in order to be able to include content in an institutional repository, um, the repository would have to have the right to, to distribute and reproduce copies of the work. Um, this would be true for a publisher, for example, that wanted to publish a journal article. The duration of copyright is very long. It is currently life of the author plus 70 years. And when copyright expires, we say the work enters the public domain. So works that are in the public domain can be freely used, freely copied, derivative works can be made, no permissions need to be sought. Um, however, much of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is still protected by copyright. Things that are in the public domain include works published in the U.S. prior to 1923, and then for unpublished works, that would be authors who died prior to 1941. So sometimes it can be very difficult for unpublished works. Even if you know who the author is, you may not know whether or not they are still alive. And if they have passed away, it can be sometimes difficult to determine um, death dates. Um, sometimes Social Security records are used for that purpose. So copyright notice, um, that C in a circle that we're so used to seeing, is no longer required um, for something to be protected by copyright. So conversely, if you're looking at a web page or something like that and you don't see a copyright notice, that doesn't mean that the work isn't copyrighted. I find that that's a somewhat um, common misperception sometimes among students, that they see a web page, they don't see a copyright notice, and they interpret that as being public domain. A source that I would recommend for determining copyright term is Peter Hurdle's chart. Um, I've given you the URL here. Please don't be furiously trying to write this down because you will get a copy of the slides after this presentation and you'll have the link on those slides. So copyright is lasts for a very long time pretty big bundle of rights um, granted to the author. However, there is fair use and other exceptions that are there basically to kind of bring some, some balance to copyright law. Fair use is an exception in copyright law that we rely on highly in education. Um, it is a balancing test, which means that you can perhaps not meet a fair use test for one factor. Um, and that does not mean that your use is not fair use. It's a balancing of all four factors together. The first factor is purpose and character of the use. So the more that something is used for teaching, research, and scholarship, 
the more likely it is to be fair use. If something's used for commercial use or um, for profit or for advertising, that opposes fair use. Um, one of the areas that is protected under copyright law is also criticism, comment, and parody. Um, and those are areas that sometimes with what we are doing, our faculty members and students are doing in higher education with comment and criticism falls very firmly in fair use. The nature of a copyrighted work is the second factor. The more factual or nonfiction um, a work is, the less it's protected by fair use, the more or less it's protected by copyright. The more something is creative, um, such as poetry and art, um, the more it is protected by copyright. So therefore, often if you're dealing with something very creative, less of that work may actually may actually be fair use, or using less of that work may actually be fair use. Also, unpublished works are more protected by copyright, and that's because one of the acknowledgments is that the creator of the work should have the ability to determine when or if something is published. The amount is the third factor of fair use, so the smaller the portion of the work that's used, um, the more appropriate it is for an educational purpose, for example, the more highly that favors fair use. The, using the entire work of something can often be a hard fair use argument to make. And there is also this concept in copyright law called the heart of the work. And the heart of the work is when what you're using may be only a portion of the work, but it is the reason someone would want to have the work. For example, if someone were to take a photograph of me, or you can see my picture on the slide, the, that's actually a cropped photograph. Um, there's my friend's um, apartment in the background. That's actually where that was taken. And so even though that is using only a portion of that photograph, really I was the only person in that photograph kind of the subject of the photograph, so that's the heart of the work. So sometimes trimming something down doesn't necessarily get you fair use, even though you're using less of it, um, if the amount that you're using or the part that you're using really is the heart of the work. The effect on the market or the potential market is the factor that tends to get the most um, most attention sometimes in court cases. And essentially, if there are licensing or permissions available for something, then that disfavors fair use. If there is a market for that work um, because it's a photograph by a professional photographer who makes their living off of um, their photographs, then using that would perhaps oppose fair use um, because they would expect licensing fees. If your use basically substitutes for someone being able to market the work or have a potential market for the work that disfavors fair use. Where that can come into play is um, sometimes faculty have an impression that if a book is out of print, that means that a use of the entire book would be fair use. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, the reason that's not the case is that the publisher may decide they want to bring that out as an ebook, and we have seen publishers do that. That would be a potential market for the copyrighted work. Um, so fair use is a balancing test. It is a gray area that drives a lot of people crazy, but realize that its flexibility also is part of its strength. So I did want to mention one other exception to fair use, and that is the classroom teaching exception. And I realize this isn't directly related to institutional repositories, but if you are dealing with um, content that is created by students, for example, um, realize that there is this classroom teaching exception where in the course of face-to-face -face instruction, um, you can display the entire work with absolutely no infringement of copyright. 
So it may be that for some student works um, where fair use is in question, having those works shown in the classroom or in some other way um, may very well be one of the ex fall under one of the um, exceptions in copyright law. I also wanted to mention Creative Commons. Um, I have a feeling most of you are familiar with this, so I'm, I'm just going to touch on it lightly. But basically, Creative Commons is a way for creators to grant a license and not have to have someone ask their permission for that use. Um, you can actually search for Creative Commons licensed content at the Creative Commons website, and it is a wonderful way to find content for reuse. And I, I recommend the Creative Commons website um, to folks who are looking for images to put in a blog, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. You can find music, you can find, find PodSafe content that you can use in podcasts. So it really is a wonderful resource. So the takeaway is that the paradigm of copyright is this granting of exclusive rights to the creator upon creation with some exceptions carved out um, for that progress of science and the useful arts, the use of um, copyrighted content. There is an expression in copyright law, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and essentially that refers to the fact that none of us can really produce new knowledge without relying on the knowledge of those who have gone before us. So, in dealing with institutional repositories, one of the questions is who owns the copyright? So for faculty and student generated content, really who is the copyright owner and how do you know? So the traditional approach that universities have taken is that they have not claimed copyright in faculty members' academic works or in student works. Now, I, I specifically use the term academic works for faculty members because there are some institutions where um, faculty members teaching in an online course, for example, where the university may claim copyright in the course materials. Um, that's certainly not across the board, but it's worth looking at your institution's intellectual property policy to see where your institution stands. Realize, too, that if the work has been published somewhere else, copyright may have been assigned to the publisher. So even if your faculty member or student created the work, if it's been published somewhere, they may no longer be the copyright owner of that work. So let's pause for a second um, and see if there's kind of any questions on copyright in general, anything that is unclear. Um, next, we're going to talk about copyright applied specifically to types of materials and contracts in social media sites. Mm, hold on one second, please. I am for classroom exemption. Can you repeat showing content semester after semester? I was under the impression that you had to seek copyright license if you reuse content semester after semester. Um, that is a guideline that a number of institutions follow. Um, what you're talking about when you're talking about um, using content for classes semester after semester, you're talking about reserves. And reserves actually don't fall under the classroom exception, they fall under fair use. The classroom exception really is for face-to-face -face instruction, um, and reserves are generally accessed outside of the classroom. So for fair use, um, there is an opinion that if, um, and I believe this is in the ALA guidelines, that you should seek permission for content that you use semester after semester. And the idea being that that is part of then what um, is the curriculum for that class. And so it would be fair to the copyright owner to pay permissions fees. In fair use itself, however, there is actually not a specification of time. Um, so that's actually an interpretation of fair use that some libraries follow 
and they choose to seek permission using content more than one semester. Okay, well let's move on then to social media sites. How many of you are using social media sites already? Um, and that can be Facebook, Flickr, Vimeo, etc. Um, to display or share institutional content. Social media sites are definitely very powerful tools to highlight what an institution has. Um, and they're a great way to build community. Um, but there are some things that we're going to talk about to consider when using these sites. So it looks like 71% of you are already using social networking sites or social media sites. So perhaps you can share some of your experiences or some sites that you found more friendly um, in their terms and conditions than others. So let's talk about copyright and data. I mentioned earlier that some things can't be copyrighted, and data is one of those things. And I'm referring here to facts and figures as data. It's not protected by copyright in its raw form, as it were. But there may be confidentiality considerations if the data is collected about people. Um, this is particularly true in the medical sciences and sometimes in the social sciences as well. There also may be restrictions on distributing the data, depending on how it was collected and from whom, and the project that collected the data. So realize that while it may not be protected by copyright, um, you may not want to distribute data widely. Um, and I would say that the best person or people to consult on that is whomever compiled the data set um, to begin with. Realize that while data itself cannot be copyrighted, the expression of data, such as a chart or a graph, are protected by copyright. So you might have an underlying set of data represented in a bar graph in one instance and a pie chart in another, and those would both be protected by copyright. With photographs, um, the photographer is actually the copyright owner of the photo um, as the creator of the photograph. However, the person, if there is one, that's represented in the photograph may have some rights in their Im image and likeness under state law, not copyright law, which is federal law. But this really is generally only a concern if you're using the photograph in some form of advertising um, or a press release or something like that. Now, if the person in the photograph is famous, you may want to kind of give special consideration um, as to the use of the photo, um, particularly if you're going to be putting the photograph on the web. And I say that because um, California has some pretty strict laws about the use of um, celebrity um, images, et cetera, that came about in part because of Hollywood being in California. And so I'm you know, not suggesting don't ever use a picture of someone who's famous on a web page, but just understand um, whether or not there might be some implications of doing that. For video, it is the videographer who is the copyright owner of video. And it may be um, that the videographer would need permission for appearances of people in the video. Often videos include um, music scores or recordings um, in the videos themselves. If the video has a dramatic work being read or poetry being read, um, that's another set of rights to consider. And if there's other copyrighted content included in the video. Um, videos are very powerful ways to get messages across um, and can be works 
of great creativity, but they can also pose some interesting problems for copyright um, because of the underlying content, which may have its own set of rights issues. For example, and we have had poetry readings um, sponsored in the library, and they have been filmed and they've been put on iTunes University, of which Emory is a member. And in order to do that, we had speaker releases from the people who were doing the readings. And then we also um, got permissions for the poems being read um, that were currently protected by copyright. So we ended up getting kind of two sets of rights clearances for the poetry reading. Um, but once we've done that, they're available on iTunes University and um, have actually had quite a, quite a number of downloads. A resource that I would recommend for dealing with the issues of copyright in video is the Code of Best Practices and the Fair Use of Online Video. It's out of the Center for Social Media and again, don't try and scribble down this um, URL because you'll get the slides later. Um, but the Center for Social Media actually has done several code of best practices um, that are very useful because they have examples within them um, that would commonly come up for people who are doing online video or there's another one for documentary filmmakers that's um, applicable here as well. So the takeaway is that your faculty or student is going to need to give you permission to post their works, their content in an institutional repository. But there might be other copyright owners as well who need to give permission for content to be displayed. Unless there's an exception applies, Fair use being a very common one um, that I mentioned that we rely on heavily. Um, and I mentioned earlier the classroom exception. It may be in the case of a student produced work, for example, where they have included um, images and music and various other things in a very creative way um, and falling under fair use use for the classroom, um, but it may be that putting that content on an open website or an open institutional repository may be stretching fair use beyond what um, your institution is comfortable with, and so an alternative might be to have that displayed in the classroom or to have that on a site that's restricted to the class, such as your course management system. So sometimes, really, it's entirely unclear as to what you can do with some of the content that may be in faculty and student generated works. For example, orphan works are works where you can't determine the copyright owner, or if you can determine who the copyright owner is, you can't find them. And orphan works create a particular challenge both for libraries and for our users because you just kind of hit a wall. And um, there was some legislation that was proposed to deal with orphan works that never made it out of um, Congress and I'm not certain made it out of committee. The issue around orphan works is a concern particularly among photographers and others that if orphan works legislation were to pass, that people wouldn't take the time to try and even find the copyright owner. And for um, commercial photographers, their income is entirely really the license fees that they charge for their photographs. In my personal opinion, I think their fears were a bit ungrounded because we can find them, um, particularly if, if they're living. And unfortunately, what has happened is that there is a whole group of materials that libraries have in their collections, particularly special collections, where we'll never be able to determine who the copyright owner is. Photographs where we have no idea who took the photograph. 
They have no real commercial value, but they have great cultural and historical value. So hopefully orphan works can be addressed again, um, perhaps more successfully. The other part of risk assessment is really an interpretation of fair use. And the question on um, allowing content to be used semester after semester is an example of an interpretation of fair use. Many institutions will um, do just that, get permissions for content if it's used in course reserves after one semester. And those actually came out of guidelines, not this copyright statute itself. So fair use is a balancing test. I said it was a gray area and therefore very powerful. But many institutions, for clarity, will interpret fair use for themselves. And as a result, you need to know what your institution's fair use guidelines are, whether it's around reserves or around posting um, orphan works on websites, um, or even using content that may not have been generated by anyone at the university. Finally, an institution's willingness or perhaps unwillingness to take risk. Um, this varies from institution to institution, and I would recommend talking to your general counsel if you have one. Um, about institutional risk and where the institution stands. If you don't have a general counsel, then I would suggest going to your library administration and you know kind of asking for um, some guidelines from your library administration on the risk that they are or are not willing to take. Realize that in a risk assessment, state schools have what is called sovereign immunity. And what that means is that as a state institution, they cannot be sued for monetary damages under copyright law. And that is significant because the way that monetary damages work in copyright law is the provision for what are called statutory damages. Now, often in court cases, a plaintiff will ask for what are called compensatory damages, meaning give me money to make me whole again. Um, give me money to substitute for the loss that I suffered, often an economic loss. Um, could also be a, a personal loss, such as personal injury. But in copyright law, there's statutory damages which means that the plaintiff does not have to show that they suffered an economic harm. They just have to show that copyright infringement occurred. And then statutory damages apply per infringement. And those damages can range from $250 up to $150,000. And so that's quite a wide range. And it's this statutory damages that you see the RIAA and others in the music industry using when they bring um, suits against people who have participated in file sharing. And some of those damage awards can range in you know the hundreds of thousands of dollars for you know a handful of songs that were shared on file sharing software. So if you're a state school, you have sovereign immunity, which means that you are not subject to the statutory damages or compensatory damages under copyright law. If you're a private institution, which Emory is, then you don't have sovereign immunity. And therefore, Emory is um, perhaps less risk um, taking than state institutions might be. So realize that that can very well factor into a decision on your institution's willingness to take risk. So let's look at some of the social media sites. Um, here's a list of things commonly used by libraries, but there are many, many more. Um, iTunes U is, is very popular. Um, 
it is likely if you have iTunes U, well not likely, if you have iTunes U, then your university has already negotiated an agreement for iTunes U and you'd be subject to whatever those terms are. So social media sites have contracts that govern what you can upload and what they can do with what you've uploaded. Often these are called terms of use, terms of service, um, terms and conditions. When you go to the site, you likely will find some link, often in very fine print at the bottom, um, that will get you to whatever the terms of, and conditions are for that site. The terms and conditions of social media sites are legally binding, and they're entirely separate from copyright law. So I would recommend, as a best practice, to review the terms and conditions of a site before you start uploading content. Um, if you're reading the terms and conditions and they make absolutely no sense to you, um, then you might want to ask your general counsel for some clarity. Or if you have somebody on the staff who routinely does license agreements, they might be a little more comfortable with legalese and may be willing to help you work through what the terms and conditions mean. I will say, having reviewed a number of the terms and conditions on these sites, because they're gearing them to the everyday person, they tend to be a little less um, highfalutin in their legalese and their language and then some of the contracts that I've seen. So I think that's a good thing. And I will also say that over the last couple of years, I have seen these legal um, terms and conditions become more liberal, um, a little more geared towards um, the rights and the concerns of the users. So I think that's a good thing as well. So some common terms that you're likely to see on these sites, and this isn't a totally exhaustive list, um, but some things to, to highlight and to consider is what kind of license you're granting to the site for the content that's being uploaded. So is it to use, reproduce, distribute? Um, can somebody else prepare derivative works from the site, um, et cetera? Now you'll notice that this list, which I just kind of culled from several different contracts, really is essentially the same list of exclusive rights under copyright that we started at the beginning of this presentation. So while you may not be turning over copyright to the site, you may be granting them such a wide range of uses that the end result is um, essentially the same. That's not necessarily a bad thing. They are going to have to have a license to you know, reproduce and distribute the work. Otherwise, they couldn't display it on the web to begin with. Um, prepare derivative works, you might want to give some thought to if you have some concerns about that. Um, but just realize that you may be granting a license for the complete set of rights that you get under copyright. Also, the site is going to make you, meaning the institution or the user, um, responsible for copyright. And that includes any content that may infringe and likely are going to ask you to indemnify the site for that content. So just be aware that you're considered to be kind of in the driver's seat for determining the copyright status of what goes on to these sites, and then you're also in the hot seat if, unfortunately, you got it wrong. So um, the last thing is there's often guidelines for the types of materials that can be uploaded, um, and this is common, you know, nothing that's obscene, libelous, etc. So I don't think that would be an issue, just realize that that's going to be part of the terms and conditions. So some, some things that you might want to consider is how long is the license granted for? Is it perpetual? Um, as the saying goes, forever is a very long time. And you know, what happens if you want to remove the material? Does it really go away or you know, is it still stored on their server and just the access is removed? And then 
you know, how expansive are the reuse rights for folks who might be accessing the content? And you might want to consider whether or not you can attach a Creative Commons license to the content. I know there are some institutional repositories that give um, users the opportunity to select a Creative Commons license for the content that they submit. And I think that Creative Commons licenses fit well with the purposes of libraries and universities, which is to generate and, and share knowledge. So that's something to consider. Also, what kinds of content might benefit from being included in a social media site? And I listed three examples here to walk through. Um, and they're totally made up um, and happy to you know, consider some other examples as well. But let's say that you've um, got a collection of historical photographs. You know the photographs are all in the public domain. But they have a lot of unidentified people or places in them. So you might want to post them on you know, Flickr and ask for comments. Maybe people can identify who the folks are or where the photographs were taken. And in that case, you really have um, little to no legal risk because the photos are in the public domain. Um, and it might be a great way to build community around on those historical photographs and build some buzz for your collections. Let's say you have students doing projects as a class assignment. Let's say they have to do um, a video essay or a video diary. And likely there's going to be third party copyrighted content as part of that. Now that third party copyrighted content may very well fall under fair use. And if a student does a project and like that and turns it into a professor, there, there's no copyright concerns there. If the professor shows that in the classroom, there's no, no copyright concerns there. But if that same video was shown on a um, website that the world can see, there might be copyright concerns. It, it depends on whether or not um, the content in the video falls under fair use or not and how risk averse um, or um, how willing to take risk your, your institution is. And then also it depends on the student giving permission for their project to be put on the web because they are the copyright owner of the video project. And photos from a faculty member of an architectural dig um, where the photographers are unknown, that kind of falls in that orphan works category. And it may be these are things that would benefit from being on a social media site, but maybe not if the architectural dig was well documented by a lot of other people and there's already a lot of content out there, you know, maybe these photos don't add much to the conversation. So it may not be, you may have content that just really doesn't kind of lend itself to a social networking or social media site. One of the things that we have found is that campus events where we have speakers come um, can be a great way to um, share with the wider community what's going on in our campus, what's going on in the library, highlight collections that we have in the sense of a poetry reading. So that kind of content can be great content to share. Um, and, you know, I think that's an area where libraries can really kind of shine in um, using some social media sites. Another thing you might want to consider is what's the functionality of the social media site? Um, does it have streamed content or, you know, is it like iTunes U where essentially the content is intended to be downloaded and taken away, um, you know, and that is the design of the iTunes software. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not positing that as a criticism, but realize that, you know, for iTunes and iTunes U, the intention is that copies are going to be made, um, which definitely implicates copyright law. 
It might be that access restrictions either for the campus or login for a class might be appropriate for some content. Um, and so that might be something you might want to explore. Um, the fourth factor of fair use being impact on the market. This is an area where that um, sometimes can come into play when you're really um, assessing risk. It may be you have some content that you think is fair use, but you're not confident is fair use, in which case, you know, doing that fair use analysis, um, you get to the fourth factor of impact on the market. And like we do with reserves where we limit access to the students in a class, it might be appropriate to limit access to the students in that class or in a class. Um, one thing I want to bring your attention to um, if you have a few minutes sometime, is Margaret Gold Stewart, who works for YouTube, gave a TED Talk on how YouTube thinks about copyright. And it's, it's short um, and definitely was a very interesting look at YouTube's own um, kind of conundrum sometimes of dealing with copyrighted content. And again, you don't need to worry about the URL because you'll get a copy of this slide. But I will say that I had kind of two concerns around YouTube's approach to copyright. And essentially what they're doing is creating a database where the content creators can tell YouTube, yes, you can or no, you can't um, post this content. Um, so and that applies to music, video clips that people are doing of films, etc. And the concern that I had in that approach is that nowhere is fair use factored into that. It, it's kind of either, you know, you have that content and the copyright owner has agreed it can be posted or you don't. Um, and also, it happens entirely behind the scenes so that when someone posts a video with background music from one band, that may you know, clear the copyright hurdle because of this background database that's running um, and be posted and be fine. And yet that same video with a different background of music may actually be taken down by YouTube because the copyright owner of the second set of music had not given um, YouTube the okay to include their content on the YouTube site. So it's definitely a short video worth looking at, um, but it does kind of highlight that this is a, a difficult area, not only for libraries to navigate, but for some of the social media sites as well. So the kind of overall takeaway is that social media sites are very powerful sites. They are a great way for libraries to share content. and to build community and, and to build buzz around that content. I would suggest that a best practice would be to understand the terms of the site, just so you know what you're getting yourself into. You may want to choose one site over another, Vimeo over YouTube or YouTube over Vimeo, etc. cetera. Um, I would say choose the content. You want to share that way wisely. Um, and then understand your institution's risk tolerance. And finally, here's a, a list of resources. Um, and just to highlight, um, the US Copyright Office website, um, copyright.gov, has a wealth of information, not only the text of the copyright law, but copyright circulars that are a good way to kind of dig down into some of the um, particulars of copyright law. And I mentioned previously the Center for Social Media Code of Best Practices. Um, that site is definitely worth checking out. And then two ALA books that I find myself going back to sometimes for, for quick, um, quick questions and, and, and good answers that I think do a particularly good job of um, laying out you know, copyright questions and answers for libraries in particular. So now as a follow-up, um, Another polling question, or actually the same polling question, about your level of confidence in applying copyright 
um, and contracts to institutional repositories. And um, also, any questions that you have um, about what we've talked about or copyright um, as applied to institutional repositories. As I said, we really did not touch on text. I think that is covered um, pretty well in other places. So let me see. I am trying to get to the questions. Let's see. We have a question about old postcards and whether they can be digitized since most of the companies who sold them are long out of existence. Um, interesting. We've had that very same question. And um, we did a lot of work trying to determine if the postcards were in the public domain and really fell into the category of orphan works. And so this gets into the question of um, your institution's risk tolerance um, and whether or not you feel that, you know, is, is the risk particularly high for these, photo, these postcards and is your institution willing to take the risk if you post them on a website. Um, the other option is you may want to post them um, digitize them and have them available within the um, library only. Um, that's another option if you find that your institution is not particularly risk tolerant. A question on transferring visual recordings onto a new format for preservation. Um, DVD when the resource is not available on DVD. That actually is a um, question on Section 108 of the Copyright Law, um, which rather than trying to answer that, because Section 108 has a lot of different hoops to jump through um, and really applies only to library preservation, what I'm going to suggest is that the ALA website has a copyright slider that is specifically for Section 108, and um, you can basically kind of pose your question to the copyright slider, and it will give you an answer as to whether or not that falls under um, Section 108 um, for digitization. And the next question, for classroom exemption, can you repeat showing content semester after semester. Okay, that one we've already answered. Can you talk about educational exhibits and ones that charge exhibit fees for seeing copyrighted items? Okay. Um, well, unpacking that question, there's actually kind of two parts to it. One is, if you're saying it's an educational exhibit, versus um, one that charges exhibit fees. Um, you could charge exhibit fees and, and still have the purpose be educational. So I think perhaps the, the better way to break it down may be what is on exhibit. Um, if you have copyrighted items, um, books for example, that you have on exhibit, those are there's no copy made, so there's really no copyright implication. If you're making copies of things, let's say you don't want to put the original of the book or you don't want to put the original of the photograph in the exhibit, um, you can make an argument um, even under Section 108 or under fair use that you know your copy is for a very limited purpose, has no impact on the market, and um, you know is for the purpose of that exhibit, and that is a practice that is pretty common. When you talk about films, um, if you have films that you want to to show, that actually gets into a different matter. 
And with films, if you are showing films to a group of people outside of your um, close acquaintances, whether you charge admission or not, um, likely you're going to need to have um, a license from the filmmaker to be able to do that. So I hope that answered the question. Um, if not, feel free to, to ask a follow-up. Who is the copyright owner of a digital image of an unpublished letter? Is it a derivative work? Um, that is actually a very good question and one that is, I would say, slightly murky. And the reason that I say that is often um, museums and archives create digital images and will sell them. And the, this is part of their revenue stream. If the unpublished letter is in the public domain, there's no copyright owner of the unpublished letter. But the archive or museum or even library who created the digital image may still claim a fee for the digital image and may claim rights in the digital image as a derivative work um, when the underlying work is in the public domain. Um, they can get away with that, as it were, because contractually they own the physical object and therefore can restrict access to the physical object. There is a um, move in the museum and archive community to perhaps rethink that a little bit because the unpublished works are the works that are in the public domain kind of do belong to all of us as a cultural heritage. And so there's some school of thought that really those things um, should not be subject to permissions, fees for reuse. What about videos that students produce as they film students on campus? Who owns that copyright? Well, the student that made the film um, would own the copyright in the film. Depending on what the student who made the film wants to do with it, um, it may be that they need some releases from students who appeared in the film. And, and I'm not talking about kind of folks in the background that you really can't see who they are, but if his um, three best friends were actors in the film and then he wanted to um, turn that into um, um, something on a website, I mean, I'm sure he and his friends are all friendly um, right now, but they may not be in the future. And in that case, if it's something he, the student really does kind of want to um, post on the web and, and really distribute widely, he should have the OK from the students who appear as actors, et cetera, in the film. Next question is, are there exceptions for creating copies for the disabled to use with software? Um, there are some exceptions. This is not an area that I have done a lot of research in. Um, but there are some exceptions for Braille, um, et cetera. And the issue, however, of software to use them with um, is slightly separate. Um, there is software that does help with the use of content for those who have vision and, and hearing impaired. Um, I do know that um, one of the issues with Amazon's Kindle is some of the publishers objected to Kindle making that content um, be able to be read, you know, voiced um, rather than having to read on a screen, which of course been very useful for folks with visual impairment. So yes, there are some exceptions, um, but they don't always get us where we want to be. And I would say if you have an office on your, cam on your campus that um, 
provide services for students with disabilities, they are probably the experts on your campus for those kinds of questions. What about geospatial data sets? Um, the had a conversation with our GIS person about this. Um, maps are protected by copyright. However, um, if you're talking about coordinates, um, you know where something exists, um, longitude and latitude, um, that's really data. So it depends on kind of you know are you talking about the underlying data of you know the geo reference point, or are you talking about its expression or representation as a map. And you know, once you get to the point of a map, then it's clearly copyrighted. I understand there is kind of an in-between there. And I also understand that even within the GIS community, there isn't always 100% um, agreement as to kind of when you've hit the point that um, um, something is copyrighted. The next question is, how do you define famous? Lisa, um, why don't you do one more, and then we'll need to, to wrap this up. OK. Um, famous would be someone that would be very easily recognizable to the general public. And that would be how I would define famous. And oh. we ahead. want that to be the last one? Well, we'll what I was going to say is we do have a log of the questions. And if you're willing, <laughs> then we'll send you the log of the questions and you can answer them and we'll send them out to everybody. Would that sure. be all right? Okay. Well, in that case, it's now 301. And Lisa, we want to thank you for the excellent copyright overview and for an information-packed webinar on social media-related copyright issues. We're very grateful to you for sharing your expertise today. Thank you also to our attendees. I hope you found Lisa's session helpful. You will soon receive an online evaluation form. I urge you to take a few minutes to respond to it because the Alex Continuing Education Committee considers your comments and opinions to be valuable in future planning. Information about past and future webinars can be found, and I need to show my screen and move you to the next one there. Um, can be found on the Alex homepage on the ALA website. Since new webinars are constantly in development, we urge you to check back periodically to see whether one um, new webinar or another might be of interest to you. Suggestions for additional webinars are also welcome. On the slide that you're currently viewing, you see the next three webinars in the Alex IR webinar series. On April 13th, there's one on repository metadata. On May 11th, one on use, utilizing institutional repositories, and one on June 1st, re-engineering the IR to engage users. All really good topics. I wish to extend a big thank you to Yuan Li for providing technical support for today's webinar. Without our volunteer tech support group, the Alex Continuing Education Committee could not offer its intensive program of webinars. On behalf of Elisa Macklin and the entire Alex CE Committee, I thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope that you will take advantage of other Alex continuing education offerings in the future. And we promise to get you everything we've said we would send you in the very near future. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.